I've talked about this before. I think a much more reasonable Overton window would be like, you know, like on the far left or the far right end of it is people like Bernie Sanders or AOC, but that's, right. that's as far right as it goes. Yeah. Right. right. And as far left is sort of the, you know, sub subcommandante Marcos and the Rahava revolution and, and, you know, and, and, and the sort of radical sort of libertarian Marxism, I, I, that, you know, or, or libertarian socialism like that. Like yeah. I, I find that to be very compelling. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think however we get there is great. All right. Hi, and welcome to Red Reviews. Uh, I think this is number 38, 37? <laughs> something, 30 something. We'll go with that. Yeah, the podcast where we talk about uh, a variety of books and uh, usually with a leftist uh, kind of perspective. And yeah. Thanks to my co-host, Justin Clark. Thanks for having me again, Corey. This is fun. Um, yeah, I think to, uh, this week is going to be a heavy hitter for us, for you Red Reviews fans. We're doing two shows this week. Um, yeah. Because I took off the 4th of July because there were so many fireworks near my house that the audio would have been bad. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> yeah. cause I don't know. I mean, to be honest with you, what is worth celebrating in the United States in 2023? <laughs> I'm just trying to question. figure out exactly yeah. what, what is worth celebrating. Um, so on that note, you know, this mm-hmm. episode was originally supposed to be scheduled to be recorded on July 4th. So, um, and I kind of structured it that way on purpose. So we're still doing it in July. Um, and what I kind of, the book that we're going to be discussing tonight um, is The S Word, A Short History of American Socialism, or a Short History Ooh. of an American Tradition Socialism by John Nichols. Um, cool. This is the updated edition. He published, I think, an earlier version of this about 10 years ago, and a few years ago he put out this edition, which isn't radically different. It just has a few more like extra chapters and, and sort of extra stuff in it. Okay. Um, and so uh, – so John Nichols is a writer for the nation. I think he's like their, their Washington bureau person. Um, and he is somebody who I've read for quite a long time. I remember reading John Nichols in high school when I read the nation and I still read the nation today. Um, he also, um, I think has written for Jacobin. He's written for a lot of other publications. Um, he's the co-author of Bernie Sanders's uh, Bernie Sanders's recent book, um, "It's Okay to Be Angry About Capitalism," which was okay. a book, which was a book that we were going to cover on the show, but quite frankly, I ju- I finished reading it. It's okay. good, but a lot of what we would have talked about with that book, we're going to talk about with this one. Ah. So it was kind of like duplicating efforts. Um, and while I liked that book, I didn't love it. So it was it was more of a, I think our I own, imagine. Yeah, I imagine that kind of like that book would be much like, you know, the thing we talk about every two weeks. Yes. Like, like, it's, yeah. there's really nothing <laughs> like, even like, honestly, even the title's kind of clunky. It's okay to be angry about capitalism. Right. We're right. going to just do a quick aside. I'm just going to give you my brief thoughts. <laughs> Sounds good. To set up this book because. I feel like that book is a very logical extension of this one because obviously John Nichols was involved in writing this. Right. So um, here's a big problem I have with the book, with Bernie Sanders's book. Throughout the book, he he constantly uses the phrase uber capitalism. You find you find this all the time in people on sort of the social democratic or democratic socialist left of whom I have a lot of affinity for and, and identify with in a lot of ways. But they use these terms like mega capitalism or super capitalism or uber capitalism <laughs> and all this kind of shit or like crony capitalism, blah, 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 blah. It's just capitalism. <laughs> Let's not qualify it anymore. Okay. Yeah, We're in an age where like this is capitalism. This is capitalism as it's intended. By yeah. using the language uber capitalism, it implies that somehow if we just get to capitalism, that will be better. 
Yeah, if we just get to what pure pure capitalism, capitalism is, the right, the correct. Capitalism. So, like with the right wingers, if we just get to like the pure capitalism, like the real free market, and for right. sort of the sort of social democratic, progressive, liberal left, it's if the, we just take those hard edges if off. We of take it, we'll just... off the hard edges. Everything. Will be better. <laughs> now, I want to say this right off the bat: a lot of what Bernie Sanders argues for in the context of the United of U.S. politics is extremely radical, right. but. In most of the rest of the world, he would be center left. He would be what yeah. would be the center left, not Barack Obama, not Joe Biden, who are considered the center left. In yeah. any reasonable political compass, both Obama and Biden would be on the center right. Yeah. Um, and Sanders would be on the center or center left, right? Yeah. Um, so like you and I have much, our, our politics are much farther to the left than say Bernie is. Yeah. Even though I have a tremendous amount of respect for Bernie and I probably sure. wouldn't be here without it. But just using that phrase, uber capitalism, every time I read it in the book, it made me wince and kind of cringe. <laughs> but like, yeah. it's just capitalism, dude. Like, just, it's capitalism. Like, just say it. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and the other thing I have a real frustration with the book is he mentions socialism once. Oh, no. And it's in reference to him being a democratic socialist. That's it. There's never a mention of socialism, even though what he's actively advocating for is a form of democratic socialism, where right. it's you know, public control of major industries and having workers be on boards and setting up worker cooperatives and setting up okay. a very robust system of universal public benefits. Like All of that is a form of democratic socialism or social democracy. Yeah. But he doesn't use the terms like socialism or social democracy really other than to describe himself as a democratic socialist or to rebut right wingers who call even the most mild forms of welfare state capitalism socialism um i just it's a real muddying of the waters in terms of what mm. socialism and copy capitalism really is which this book does too okay. um and it's frustrating so like this book is clearly written from somebody whose politics are closer to Bernie Sanders than, say, somebody whose politics are closer to, um, I don't know, who would be more of the sort of, you know, like like us, like somebody who's either right. an anarchist or somebody who's a Marxist, like somebody who's clearly like our politics are a lot more radical than this. Um, so, so Bernie's book, It's Okay to Be Angry About Capitalism, I would have much – I would have much rather – him call the book something like um like the crisis of capitalism or just keep it shorter like mm. you know you know like in yep. defense of democratic socialism something like just because it's okay to be angry about capital well no shit i mean most people are <laughs> angry about capitalism right like yeah I don't, that's right and he and he leads with a lot of this like statistical information which i think nichols was probably responsible for of like why the capitalist system sucks and it's like, no shit. Most people who live them, experience, who experience them every day know that they suck and yeah. are terrible. Um, and so I found the book to be good, but it's not anything radically different from his other two books. It's kind of the same stuff. Um, you know, I mean, but there are ideas in it that are interesting. Like I, I really do like the idea of robust, independent, not-for-profit journalism you know, that's, you know, supported by federal money, but is as independent editorial authority. Um, right. You know, like that would be, th that's something in terms of sort of figuring out and trying to address the crisis of media. I think that's a good mm -hmm. thing. You mm -hmm. know, the idea of workers being on, on boards of major companies and, and making that be required by law, like they do in Germany. I think that's a good thing. Um, overhauling the educational system where we move away from the sort of very deeply regimented and in many respects, authoritarian way of providing education to kids um, in the United States um, to moving more towards like a Scandinavian model where children don't really get grades until they're a certain age and they don't have to take tests until a certain age. And, um, there's a more natural evolutionary style of children learning that would be much more mm -hmm. beneficial. Um, so it's a good book and I, and I, I recommend people read it. Um, uh, but at the same time, it has all of the problems with it that a lot of these like politician books have, which is there's a lot like with Bernie, especially who I love, but this is his big issue rhetorically. Like when he's giving a speech and he repeats things, or sort of repeats phrases as a speech that works great. Right. On the page, it's a little, it's just a little cringy for me. Like I don't, I don't love it in like book form. I want my books to be a little less 
like sort of rhetorical in that sense but <laughs> right. I, but, but Debs was like that too and so like it's it's I mean I get the the sort of making the argument because he makes you know I think Bernie Sanders is really good at making the moral argument as much as he is making the sort of pragmatic techno Cratic argument for why modern capitalism in America blows and we should do something else. He's good at explaining that. But he's also good at explaining the basic moral precepts behind having a worldview outside of the confines of, of traditional sort of capitalism. Um, so it's a good book. It's not like earth shattering. I mean, I think if you are involved in left politics in any way, you won't really you know everything that you'll know everything that he's saying i think the most interesting stuff in the book is when he says like here are real here are some real world examples of the kind of policy i want to do so if you're not aware of those those are kind of interesting like the educational example or the sort of worker cooperative example or something like that if you don't know that much about it then that's really worth checking out um but i i mean but you know i think like there are other books that do it too. Like we've, d- we've talked about d- democracy at work by Richard Wolf, right? Right. That's another right. book. People can kind of check out and get the general gist of the issue um, that has a much more theoretical foundation. Um, um, so, so yeah, I right. mean, it's Bernie Sanders. I mean, he is about as left as the mainstream goes. So, you know, it's going to have a lot of the same thing. Yep. Um, but I think that with, so let's pivot into talking about the S word. Okay. Um, but before I actually, before I do that, do you have any other further thoughts about like Bernie Sanders and sort of the general idea of sort of what his no. style of politics represents? I, I, I mean, I like Bernie. Me too. You know, <laughs> it's, it's hard to be mad at him for being himself and being, cause yeah. he is part of the establishment in a sense, yeah. but he's also as radical as he can be in, in that role. Yeah. And I, I got no problem with him and or what he's doing. <laughs> exactly. I'm not like one of those cynical people um, who, well, he doesn't, he's done this and that and the other. So he's not in my wheelhouse or whatever. And it's like, no, it's like, I'm a much more ecumenical socialist. I, right. I don't really have that much of an interest in sort of strict delineations of dogma. Now I'm saying that right now. And then what I'm about to critique this book for is kind of, a problem, <laughs> it's gonna sound the but it is time. kind of a problem for me. <laughs> so I do have certain baseline things of what I think of socialism as being. Yeah. And so, so anyway, so uh, John Nichols uh, wrote this book in many respects as a reaction to the Obama years. Um, it was very okay. much how every, you know, psycho right winger on television calling Obama like a socialist or a Marxist or whatever, even though he is center right, his politics are far closer to Richard Nixon than say Che Guevara. Um, It is, it's um, very frustrating. Um, And in many respects, Richard Nixon on domestic policy was to the left of Obama on on a lot of stuff. So, so Nichols is like, not only is what they're saying nonsense, but there actually is a very deep American tradition of political radicalism. Right. And I think that's what I would have much rather this book be called or something, because the book's not really a a history of American socialism, although it is to an extent. Mm. It's kind of a broader history of like the sort of broader left in America. It's, it's oh, okay. So like he, he, he sort of, he plays fast and loose with like the term socialist or left. So ah. socialist can mean somebody as radical as say like Emma Goldman, who was right. an anarchist. Um, or say like Martin Luther King, who was sort of like a democratic socialist, um, all the way to, you know, uh, people who would have never openly identified as socialists, but were sort of politically radical for their time. Um, people like Thomas Paine, like Thomas right. Paine, the term socialism itself didn't exist before his time, but you know, there are many ideas of his, which we would look at as being socialism today. Um, so that's really like kind of my, my quibble is that like, there's a lot about this book that is just not covered. Like, so for example, the history of the American communist movement is pretty much non-existent in this book. Oh, okay. So he spends almost no time talking about, um, the emergence of the American communist party and its development in 1919. He spends Uh almost no time talking about William C. Foster, the trade unionist and head of the American communist party for many years who ran for president who had a lot of influence and sway in public policy in the 1930s, almost as much as, and here too, because why not? Oh, 
some random geek says, oh. I'm here now. You can start. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, I'm not going to start over, but we'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> That's um, right. <laughs> but yeah, so like, there's nothing of that. There's nothing about Earl Browder, who was head of the Communist Party for a while, who ran for president 36 and 40. There's no real discussion of, um, there's there's a healthy discussion of the first Red Scare in the 19 teens, which we'll get into later, but there isn't that much on the 1950s, not really. Okay. Um, and there's really no discussion of anarchists. Like Emma Goldman sort of gets a a, a, a sort of passing <laughs> mention, or you know Alexander Berkman might get a mention, but like in general, the book is much more about like a history of American democratic socialism. That's really right. what it is. It's it's not. You know, the anarchists don't really play a big role in this book. The communists don't play a big role in this book. Uh, there's the, obviously the American Trotskyist movement, which almost gets no mention at all. Um, and so those are the kind of things that we'll be covering when we cover Paul Bull's book, um, uh, which is a history of, of Marxism in the United States, where okay. it's – and we'll go into that a lot more. Um, there are other books on like anarchism that will go into this. Like when we talk about revolutionary affinities in two weeks – Right. We'll go into some of this. Oh, geez, it's that fast. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can move the schedule if you want me to. I better start reading that one fast. <laughs> <laughs> if you want me to, we can move that one around. I mean, I, I'm, I just know people are excited about it, so I sort yeah. of pushed it. But yeah, if, if we can talk I'm later. I'm also about excited it. about it, so I, I'll try and get okay. it as much as I can. Um, but if all else fails, we can always move it around and, do, and we can do something else. Um, but – so this is really where I think the limitations of the book are in the sense that he's clearly covering a very specific political tendency and not the whole history of American socialism. Right. You're, it shouldn't be the S word then, like you say. Yeah, like it's, it should it, be. it's much more of like a history of, um, you know, and I mean, his writing is very similar to like somebody like Michael Kazin, who, okay. who writes for um, Dissent Magazine, who is sort of the farthest left of the democratic party, which is kind of what John Nichols is. Um, because the, the ultimate policy subscription from John Nichols is all roads lead back to the democratic party. Um, ah. and we can get into why I think that's a huge problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Especially now, I think it was less of a problem when he wrote the book. I think it's even more of a problem now. Um, so yeah. So, Let's get into sort of the broad strokes of the book. Um, okay. We'll kind of skip. He has this really long kind of nice sort of meditation on Emma Lazarus, who was the poet who wrote, me, wrote the, the, um, the poem, The New Colossus, which is on the Statue of Liberty. You know, the give me okay. you're tired, you're, you're, you're hungry, you're poor, you're huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Lazarus never explicitly identified as a socialist, but she was very politically radical and her p political positions grew out of her sense of the immigrant experience as, you know, she was an immigrant. Um, and so that's a nice kind of moving part of the book. Um, he's a journalist. So like, this is not so he's like, a good writer. Anyway. He's a very good writer. There's no, it's very easy to read. I found reading this book quite enjoyable, even if I had disagreements with it. Right. Um, and they were disagreements on facts. It was much more just a disagreement on like perspective or focus more okay. than anything else. Um, but part of that is because I think this book is not written for me. Mm -hmm. I think this book is written much like Bernie's book. Newest book is it's not written for people like me who have been, deeply in meshed in left theory for years and have right. read tons of different stuff. He, this book is much more an introductory sort of overview of American socialism. It's, it's, you know, and, and political radicalism in general, because the S word tends to kind of encompass a lot of shit. So it's like democratic socialists, social Democrats, progressive liberals, like they all kind of get put together in a stew. And oh, okay. part of that is because American politics were like that, in which people entered into alliances and people joined with each other and they try to create what was what we what we would call the in the 1930s was called and the 1940s was called the popular front, which is something we've talked about before. I think we talked about it in the sort of left unity live stream we did last year. Right, right. Um, and the popular um, movements. We have one comment on sure. uh, YouTube from some random geek. Uh, for those interested, George Woodcock has a pretty good history book on anarchism called Socialism from Below. 
A History of Anarchism. Very cool. Thank you. I have another one of his books um, that is also, I think, just called um, Anarchism, A History of like Libertarian Ideas or something like that. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, but it's it's a book I picked up at um, Left Bank Books, the anarchist bookshop in Seattle. Um, so that might be a book we do later on in, in the show because – Very cool. Or later on in, in, in the podcast episodes because – I really do feel like there's a lot of this story that's not told. <laughs> right. I think he only goes to a certain point and goes no further. It's because there are much more radical political operatives that right. he doesn't just talk about at all. Like Claudia Jones, who is a very well-known African-American woman communist um, who did a tremendous amount of organizing the American, American Communist Party. Like she's not mentioned in the book. Right. You know, um, uh, there's just – it's – there's an emphasis on – electoralism and reformism that uh, is fine but like that's that's the focus <laughs> i suppose uh if one were being fair yeah we could say like the history of socialism in america or north america or what have you yeah it's in it's so broad it's so big a topic that even if one wanted to it'd be tough to cover it all right? absolutely that's absolutely right and i think that um i think that he, he has a very specific political orientation, and that's what the book represents. Yeah. It's much more of a history of democratic socialism in America. That's uh, a broader tradition where most of what he's talking about sort of fits into. Um, because it's that blending of sort of political and economic radicalism with the sort of broader um, political ideology of the United States, at least – what it prof- what what it professes to be like you know this nation dedicated to liberty and justice for all and that kind of you know right. that Jeffersonian ideal of equality like that kind of stuff feeds into the book and is kind of important. Um, uh, we've got another comment from sure. Simon and Beek. Uh, the history of socialism in America, volume one of fifty two. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know you're not actually that far off. Um, Philip Foner, who is a very well-known labor historian has like a history of the American labor movement. That's like multiple volumes. Um, right. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's not unheard of. Um, so, um, so like, yeah. So like, I think like Nichols's book is good. I don't get me wrong. I don't think this book is bad. I just think it's one entry point into thinking about the history of American socialism. Mm-hmm. And on our show, we'll be covering other books that emphasize and focus on other aspects of American socialism right. and American politi- and, the, and the American left that this book doesn't cover. Um, so just sure. that's sort of my my big preface to what we're going to be talking about, <laughs> which is a lot of good stuff. So um, I think it's very important to start with, um, in many respects, uh, the founding father who was probably the one that if anybody could, could have any kind of reverence for or respect for – Um, He's kind of the only one, Um, and that's Thomas Paine. Um, Thomas Paine, uh, who was a British immigrant, he was born in England, came to the United States, was a writer, he was a pamphleteer, he was an essayist. He is best remembered for writing Common Sense, which was the pamphlet that um, inspired the American Revolution. Mm. Um, But what a lot of people don't know about Thomas Paine is that as he got older, Unlike most people, he got more radical as time went on. And he wrote a, a variety of different books that were – and pamphlets that were f- even really to the left of most of the American founders and why it alienated him from the revolutionary generation of like Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Madison and all of them who had up until a certain point had had a tremendous amount of reverence for him because he laid out the sort of moral and political argument for American independence – you know, the, the the phrase the United States of America likely came from him. The first mm. time it was ever really used, um, other than the Declaration of the United of, of Independence. Like he's kind of the only guy to use that first. So, you know, Thomas Paine is is many ways like the forgotten founder, he's, you know, and he never owned slaves. Um, he was vehemently anti slavery. Um, he was never a lawyer for slave owners in the case of John Adams. Right. Um he was a full-fledged intellectual. That was what he did. Um, and 
in later pamphlets, um, he would he would take his political radicalism even further. So one of them is The Rights of Man, which he wrote in response to Reflections on the Revolution in France by Edmund Burke. Burke, who is one of the sort of founders of modern conservatism, um, who wrote about the excesses of the French Revolution. Um, Paine sort of writes a full-throated defense of the, of the French Revolution um, and its ideals and the, its principles of liberté, equalité, fraternité, and the right. idea of really moving towards a society of, of political equals. Um, he then takes these ideas even further in a pamphlet he writes called Agrarian Justice. Agrarian Justice was a pamphlet in which he argues for um, essentially old age pensions. Um, nice. And, you know, so a lot of people kind of consider him the godfather of Social Security. Um, and if you go to the Social Security website, they even kind of mention that. Like, Thomas Paine is kind of the guy who came up with this idea. Right. Um, and... And then, of course, for us, you know, the sort of skeptical and atheist bent, he also wrote The Age of Reason, which was a very influential and important pamphlet right. in the history of secularism, where he argues um, vehemently against the dogmas of Christianity and defends his own radical religious philosophy of deism, which was not atheism per se, but it was sort of God as nature or God as the creator of the universe and then not having any influence afterwards. Right. Um, you know, kind of a Spinoza-esque God, Baruch, Baruch Spinoza, the Dutch philosopher. Um, so that's Thomas Paine. And Thomas Paine would have a tremendous influence on a lot of the early leaders who would then develop what would be known as the Republican Party. Um, what people don't know is that the Republican Party in the United States actually had quite radical roots. Um, and we'll get into this more in a little bit when we talk about Lincoln, but, um, but, you know, the Republican party was founded really on the ideas of free soil, free labor, and free men. Those were the three ideals, right? And this is something Eric Foner has written about, um, another very influential historian about writing at the origins of the Republican party. Back in the 19th century, when the Republican party was formed, it was the liberal party. It was mm -hmm. the left party for all intents and purposes, within the American mainstream political spectrum. And the Democratic Party was the conservative one. It was the right-wing one. Um, it was the pro-slavery party. Um, you know, the Republican Party was was explicitly founded on anti-slavery. Not abolitionism, because those are different. Abolitionism and anti-slavery were really two different positions, and so we can get into that in a second. But, mm. but the ideas of pain, and specifically his ideas in the rights of man and agrarian justice, would lead to a lot of the um, leaders uh, who would be heavily involved in the creation of the, of the Republican Party. Um, so that's Thomas Paine, um, who, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's anybody that deserves a statue or a monument in Washington, D.C., it's him. Um, I think like if we, all of the best things about America <laughs> in terms of our ideas can be attributed to him in, right. in a lot of respects. Um, Jefferson less so because of obviously the contradictions inherent, right, but right. a lot of the ideas that animated Jefferson also animated Paine. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that's Thomas Paine. Okay. I, uh, we got a couple comments from some random geek. Uh, they said, uh, Thomas Paine is one of the founding fathers that I actually like a true revolutionary yep. too. Yep. And, and I actually listened to the audiobook parts of Rights of Men. It was the 1700s version of a response video to Burke. Pretty much, yeah. Or what we <laughs> might call a tweet thread today. Yeah, no, that's right. absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Um, and a lot of it he wrote while imprisoned um, for speaking out politically. Um, right. So, you know, uh, he wrote a lot of the Rights of Man in, in, while in prison. Um, yeah, Payne is one of the founders. I mean, if there's certain hit figures of American history that we can have some reverence for. He's one of them. Um, yeah. The other one, I think, obviously being John Brown, um, but the the man who led the slave revolts at Harper's Ferry and um, kind of saw what was coming in terms of the American Civil War. Um, and that pivots us to sort of the next big chunk of the book where we, which is, the, the, it has honestly like the coolest title of the book, or at least my favorite one which is the title is called Reading Marx with Abraham Lincoln. Um, okay. So uh, this this chapter is mostly about the development of the Republican Party, the development of the sort of radical Republican uh, 
um, political orientation and its relationship to Lincoln and Lincoln's relationship to Marx. Um, most people don't think of Karl Marx and Abraham Lincoln as being two figures that had anything to do with one another, um, right. but they very much did. Um, so Karl Marx, um, the, the obviously, you know, I mean, need he have any introduction? Um, but <laughs> you're Marx, listening to Red Reviews. Read Red Reviews, you know, <laughs> you know, you probably have an idea of who Marx is. But alongside being a brilliant philosopher and economist um, and historian, uh, Marx was also a pretty brilliant journalist. And in the 1850s and 60s, he wrote for a new for for a New York City newspaper. He wrote for the New York Tribune. Um, which was edited by Horace Greeley. Um, he was um, sort of suggested at the behest of a colleague who worked with Greeley, who was, um, for all intents and purposes, a Marxist, who wanted Marx to, to write for the paper about political and social <laughs> happenings. Uh, sorry. Karl Marx, is that the bearded man? <laughs> that is the bearded man. But he is that not is the- Santa. No, that's right. I think there's a t-shirt that's like, it says like, I am not Santa or like, this is not Santa or whatever. And it's a picture of Marx. But (laughs) Um, so Marx wrote a lot about the American crisis um, and and wrote a lot about what was going on in the antebellum period, um, the the real divisions that were happening as, as a result of slavery and was very much a champion of the union and very much a champion of Lincoln. Um, Lincoln read newspapers voraciously. Um, when he was a lawyer in Illinois, when he was a congressman, when he was um, president, he read newspapers consistently. It was probably the thing he read more than anything else. Um, that and Shakespeare um, and the Bible, those were kind of the three things Lincoln spent a lot of his time with. And uh, there's a very good shot, although we don't have any evidence to suggest this, um, that like direct evidence anyway, that Lincoln probably read Marx, that he read, maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't read the Communist Manifesto. Maybe he didn't, didn't read, have his, we don't have his copy with notes in we it. We don't have his anything. copy of the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> and like he didn't read Capital because Capital came out two years after he was assassinated. But, right. but there's a very good shot that Lincoln read Marx's columns in the New York Tribune um, and learned from them. Also at the time, um, this, you know, the Republican Party's sort of political and ideological roots are far more radical than people think. So let's go back to that idea of free soil, free labor, and free men. Um, so uh, free soil obviously represents um, uh, the abolition of slavery, that the, the we'd be free territories, free states. Mm-hmm. Um, free labor uh, was very, very important. So Marx has this quote, which I'm going to paraphrase, which is that um, you know, it's hard for the the advance of white labor when black labor is still in bondage. So he's sort of making this very big argument, which is that you wage laborers, you know, you wage slaves for all intents and purposes, you benefit from the abolition of slavery because because you can't argue for higher wages if yeah, they if can get they slaves. can just buy yeah. a person, right? Yes. And so the cause the cause of freedom for the enslaved Africans is, or the or the enslaved, is very much the cause of the unfree labor, or as they sort of saw as unfree labor or wage slavery. Um, also, Lincoln was, and most of the Republican Party in the mid nineteenth century were very much adherents of the labor theory of value. Okay, so they very much believed that labor was, uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, be sort of superior to capital. And in fact, Lincoln actually wrote that. Like there's a speech where he gives, where he says, you know, that labor is independent and prior to of capital is superior to capital. So Lincoln right away is, is saying things like Lincoln gave speeches about the nature of capitalism as a candidate, as a lawyer and as president that would be unheard of today. I don't think you could, I mean, it's deeply radical. Um, and, uh, and I think that obviously be downright un American in 2023. Be <laughs> and obviously, with any system to sort of use Marxist um, framing here, there were obviously contradictions, you know, where, you know, Lincoln for a long time had supported colonization, where instead of freeing African Americans, right. 
that they would be moved back to Africa or, and he, and he supported that well into the middle of his presidency. It wasn't mm. really until the Emancipation Proclamation and freed blacks joined the armed forces of the Union and started being a very essential role in the U.S. military that, um, and his friendship with Frederick, you know, his political alliance with Frederick Douglass, um, that Lincoln sort of started to come around and recognize that these people were just as much entitled to citizenship in the United States as anybody else. Um, so Lincoln was one of those people who was not as politically radical as, as a lot of the, of the Republican party. Um, but he was closer to them than he was to the conservative Democrats who he, mm. who he would castigate. Um, a big influence of why the Republican party and its origins was a lot more radical was the influence of German immigrants. Um, so we've talked, I think we've talked a little bit about this before in the podcast. Um, and as somebody who is of German origin, I have German heritage. Um, there were a series of revolutions in the mid eight, mid to late 1840s in Europe. The communist manifesto was written in response to the mm. revolutions going on in 1848. And when the, when these revolutions calling for sort of bourgeois democratic rights in Europe were, 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 um, squashed by the, the, um, the authority of those countries, um, specifically Germany, many of them came to the United States and they were known as the 48ers, many of them who were not able to sort of implement their more radical egalitarian vision in Europe, they did it in the United States. Okay. Um, so this is where you have members of the Union Army who were literal Marxists. Um, that were they had some of them had even known Marx, they had read Marx, and they 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 ascribed to Marx's political philosophy who were who fought in the Union Army and helped uh the Union win the war. So That's cool. there there's a, <laughs> did not know that. <laughs> yeah, so there's a very radical heritage there with the Republican Party, which is why it's so sad that the Republican Party has become what it's become. Right. Uh, because it didn't start that way. Um, but that gets into the whole switching of the party political alignments in the night, starting really in the 1930s and moving through the 1960s, where a lot of Southern Democrats alienated by civil rights, um, and the great society, Lyndon Johnson switched parties. Um, so right. a lot of sort of racist Southern Democrats, um, of 1850 became the, you know, the sort of racist reactionary Republicans of, you know, 2020. Um, and so the Democratic Party is now the sort of liberal party, although, you know, that's even a bit of a stretch. But like, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, in our in our very truncated political, comp like sort of our very truncated Overton window in America. Um, so, so, yeah, so that's the Republican Party and that's the influence on Lincoln. The most important thing I will mention is that the International Working Man's Association of the First International, which was f founded in part by Marx and Engels, sent a letter to President Lincoln um, during the middle of the Civil War, um, and Lincoln's office wrote him back. Um, okay. Back. So um, the the letter was probably that was written back to the International was probably written by John Nicolay, who was Lincoln's secretary. Um, but um, but but in the International's letter, they basically say that the cause of the Union is the cause of the of all of all people, um, and and. Um, and this letter by the International was largely written by Marx and Engels. And it's signed by them and a bunch of other people. And okay. then the White House writes back and says, thank you very much. We appreciate your support, essentially. Um, so it's not like, it's not like. Um, right. They sent a forum letter back. <laughs> yeah. It's, they sort of said, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're very much, we, you know, we, we really appreciate what you're doing. Um, but yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's very much. The, the the political ideology of the Republican Party, that idea of free soil, free labor, free men, like that, that is something I think we should apply to the 21st century, right? Where it would be, you yeah. know, you know, free soil, free labor, free people, right? We would broaden yeah. it. We wouldn't obviously use sexist language, but but right. but you know, but that idea of free free soil, not just in the sense of a free of oppression, but also literal free, as in you know, like the Homestead Act, where we actually give people the, the literal forty acres and a mule, right? Um, mm. And obviously, that process was imperfect, right? Because a lot of that land had been land of the Native Americans and had to be yeah. appropriated. Lincoln was also president when who 
who was the president who oversaw the single largest execution of Native Americans in American history um, by the government of the United States. Um, so like there are all kinds of weird contradictions and hypocrisies about the whole period, right? right? And the, the hypocrisies of Lincoln. But I think it's fair to say that there's a there's a sort of moderate radicalism within Lincoln in that whole era that may be, maybe not necessarily be socialist, but is deeply um, a more progressive than the sort of racist Southern slave owning Democrats. Um, so that was the part of the book I found the most fun to read because I study, I've been reading about Abraham Lincoln since I was a little boy. Like it's part of the, the, the mythos of Lincoln and like learning about Lincoln is, is something that I have enjoyed my entire life. Right. Um, you know, and so reading about how he was far more radical in terms of the relationship of labor and capital than we give him credit for. Um, and Lincoln was also very pro union, um, which not just in the union sense of like saving the union per se, right, right. but also so very like pro union in that, you know, he, he supported early attempts at organizing um, right. of labor unions. So, you know, that, you know, for a president in 1860s America, it's, it's pretty unheard of, but, but yeah. that's what he did. Um, so yeah, so that's that period. Um, there's a lot that he leaves out, um, in, in terms of this era. So it's, you know, but he gets the big stroke of it, right. Which is that the reason why the Republican party was so radical was because of the influence of these German immigrants who had come over right, with their, with their sort of radical ideas about socialism. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have another comment? Uh, uh, just Je uh, Jeff Thomas Black joined the chat. Oh, is, thank uh, you. Watching. So. Thanks for being here, Jeff. I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, I think for the sake of time, we'll try to, I'll try to get through some of this more quickly. Um, sure. But uh, so there's a chapter about sort of the sewer socialism of the, the early 20th century. So in places like Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where mayors like Dan Hone and um, and Frank Ziedler and others who were sort of the ones who were socialists, we believe in building a socialist world, but we're going to do it through elections. We're going to do it through persuading the public and believing in what we believing in what we do, what we want. Um, and in many respects, they were very successful. I mean, a socialist mayor was in place in Milwaukee for off and on for basically fifty years. Right. Um, well into the the the, the 1950s um, and and even later. So the, the you know the, the muni municipal socialists or what we called the sewer socialists, which was a term of derision that sort of became a, a badge of honor, um, uh, is um, you know it's how democratic socialism works in practice. The idea that you can elect people to positions of power and they can actively you know pass, you know, labor laws, they can pass public health laws, they can, you know, they can create systems of early pensions and sort of early healthcare subsidies and all kinds of different programs that improve the lot of working people. And that's what happened in Milwaukee. That's what happened in tons of cities all over the country. Um, and, uh, but Milwaukee, especially Wisconsin has always been kind of a hotbed of radicalism, which is why it's so unfortunate that in the most recent years with sort of Scott Walker's attack on public workers in the state and the, the sort of Republican usurpation of democratic rights and powers in the state has really turned back a lot of the radicalism. Same in yeah. Minnesota. So like in Minnesota, the Democratic Party isn't called the Democratic Party. It's called the, the, it's called the Democratic Farm and Labor Party. The Farm oh. and Labor Party was an independent party that eventually merged with the Democrats um, in the mid 20th century. And they were also fairly radical politically too. If you look at the history of the, the sort of the legacy of the sewer socialists and the municipal socialists um, in today's world, just look at the governorship of Tim Walls in Minnesota and, mm. and the Democratic majority there that have done a tremendous amount of really positive social democratic legislation, including universal meals for children, um, as well as making the state a trans sanctuary state. Among right. a myriad of other things, I think the legalization of marijuana, all kinds of stuff. Um, yes. Same in Wisconsin, where they've just made uh, gradual increases in taxes for education permanent for 400 years. Um, that was done by Governor Tony nice. Evers. So there is a legacy there in terms of improving people's lives in the now. 
you know, and so in the sense of like, we believe in socialism, we believe in getting there, we believe in getting to that pinnacle, but the way we do it is by gradually building on our successes and getting there. And that's kind mm-hmm. of what they do. And in a lot of ways, it was very successful. In other ways, it wasn't. Right. Um, and then the there's a whole chapter on Victor Berger and him defending the, the, the First Amendment and freedom of speech because he was politically persecuted for speaking out against World War I, um, as was Eugene Victor Debs. Um, you know, for a book about American socialism, Debs does not play a huge role in this book. That's interesting. Which is very weird. He's not in it very much. He's in it a little bit. I think part of it is it's because I think John Nichols knows that he's like, if, if anybody knows about the history of American socialism, if they know anything, they, they know, already know about they already who Debs is. Yeah. But um, so he kind of skips over Debs, even though Debs is on the cover. Not <laughs> Victor, Berger, who get, Victor Berger gets a whole chapter. Ah. Debs does not. Interesting. Um, and basically, he says, like, he's like, a lot of people have written about Debs and his presidential runs, um, but I wanted to talk more about when socialists actually won elections rather than just sort of sort of raising consciousness on issues. And I think that's a fair editorial point. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, like, I want to talk about the last big chapter, and then we can sort of talk about his general conclusions about the future of the American left and what it should do. Um, but... The other big chapter is talking about A. Philip Randolph. And A. Philip Randolph is very important. Um, and I think that devoting a chapter to him and talking about the history of American socialism is indispensable. So okay. who was A. Philip Randolph? A. Philip Randolph was um, a labor organizer. He was one of the founders of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which was okay. a union devoted to sleeping car porters for people who don't know. Back in the day, if you took long trips across the country and you didn't fly, because obviously flying was not really a thing then, um, you rode by train. And there were things called sleeping cars where you could get a meal and then you could have a bed and you could sleep. You can still do this today. But back then, it was much more influential. And porters were people who were sort of service people on these trains. And they were the ones who would, you know, get you your food and get you the morning paper and, you know, take care of your needs and whatever. And, um, and so with, um, with these porters, most of them were black. Um, a lot of them were people who had come during the great migration. So the, the, the the moving of African Americans from the Southern part of the country up North for economic opportunities. Um, the Pullman car company, which was based out of Chicago was, or near Chicago was kind of the big company that did the sleeping car porters. Um, and so a lot of the servicemen who were black, who worked on these trains were called George, even though that wasn't even their name, um, mm-hmm. because George was the first name of George Pullman, the founder of the company that made these, who ran and operated, made and operated these train cars. Randolph was the, was instrumental in the development of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the union that organized these workers together ah. for better pay and better benefits. And and he would win a lot of these battles against these unions. Um, he was paid, you know, he, the union brothers and brothers who would who were a part of that union helped pay for him to travel all over the country on these trains to advocate and agitate for organizing the union and growing the union so that they could then get a better contract out of the, the nice. their employers. He then parlays that into even bigger struggles. So he fights very, very hard at the beginning of World War II, or the, what would become World War II, for the desegregation of jobs in manufacturing for the war. So, you know, before, you know, uh, Frederick, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's executive order desegregating war industries during World War II, they were deeply segregated. And Randolph, made an argument that um, if you do not segre- if you do not desegregate these, we will have, and this sort of gives you a hint of what I'm going to get at later, we're going to have a march on Washington <laughs> to talk to to fight for the desegregation of of the war industries, which would eventually happen. And then in 1948, Harry Truman as president, under the sort of the behest of people like A. Philip Randolph, who were fighting and organizing for it, would see the full desegregation of the armed forces um, in 1948 via executive order, which stands in place today. Um, 
But A. Philip Randolph is best remembered for being the, the lead organizer of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Right. Now, most people know about the March on Washington. They know about Martin Luther King. They know about the I Have a Dream speech. Most people know yeah. about that. What they don't know is what the full title of that march was, which was the March for Jobs and Freedom. It was about economic justice as much as it was for social justice. Yeah. Randolph was a mentor to King and a lot of King's political um, uh, sort of awakening came out of his relationship with Randolph and a lot of other radical socialists and communists who he, who he was working with, people like Bayard Rustin, who was a socialist, who was also queer, who, um, who was in some respects later alienated for the movement because he was queer. Mm. Um, and, and because of his communist ties. Um, but so long story short, Randolph is the organizer for this. They then, then take it a step further, right? So we have the civil rights act of 1964, which desegregates all public spaces. We have the voting rights act of 1965, which ensures equal voting rights within the last 10 years. The Supreme court has done all they can to absolutely yeah. eviscerate these two important pieces of, of legislation, le le basically leaning on the argument of, well, racism's kind of over now. So we don't really need any of this. Um, despite the fact that like racism is like deeply endemic in the political and economic and cultural history of the United States and yeah. you just don't get rid of it. Like beep, racism gone. Like that's not how it works. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they would take their political ideas even further and they would argue for what would become the freedom budget. So Martin Luther King pivots his civil rights activism post-1965 and starts advocating for what he calls the Poor People's Campaign. And the Poor People's Campaign was all about addressing the deep economic inequality and poverty in the United States. And at one time, King moved into to a slum in Chicago to show the plight of people who lived in the inner city in the slums in Chicago, most of whom were poor, most of whom were black. And they argued for what they called the freedom budget, which was to basically fulfill what was the New Deal, uh, mm. uh, which was the idea of universal, like universal basic social rights, as well as political rights in the United States. That would be the right to a job, like a jobs guarantee. Right. Um, that would be with good wages and good benefits, a universal public health care system, universal, um, you know, uni universal pensions and the expansion of Social Security. Now, did all of the freedom budget happen? No, but a lot of it did. Um, so you have the passage of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. That's health care for the aged and the poor, respectively which still exists today. Medicare is the most popular government program in the United States. Everybody who has Medicare loves it. Yeah. So much so that they're politically confused and say things like, take your socialist hands off my Medicare. Um, <laughs> you know. um, and obviously Johnson's war on poverty and how you know that was as much an outgrowth of the organizing that – Martin Luther King and A. Philip Randolph and many within the civil rights movement were doing um, because King himself became more politically radical towards the end of his life as well, where he was arguing for anti-militarism. He stood out against the Vietnam War. He argued against the capitalist system. Um, and in many respects, you we could definitely consider Martin Luther King a democratic socialist, as was Randolph. And in many respects, mm. Randolph was also a Marxist and started as a Marxist. He was also influenced by Trotskyist ideas. And, um, and so, you know, people know that Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, April 4th, 1968 yeah. in Memphis, Tennessee. But, but very few people know why he was there, uh, as a part of his poor people's campaign, defending sanitation workers who were on strike. These are the, you know, the legendary, I am a man signs that were on okay. placards, which were on people. They would wear these as I am a man, which was a very powerful, powerful message within the civil rights movement, because it was about, again, fulfilling those ideas of free labor, free soil and free men, right? right. Like, like that's right. what I am a man represents. And that's what King represented. He was killed defending these sanitation workers.
And unfortunately, the hopes of the freedom budget never fully came to fruition. We saw the crisis in Vietnam become mm. starting to overshadow Johnson's war on poverty, which was really his true political legacy. It's what he wanted to be remembered by. Um, he always said that, you know, um, I got out of bed with, he said something along the lines of like, I got out of bed with that, with the love of my life, the great society to get into bed with that whore Viet Vietnam. Um, something along those lines, typical Lyndon Johnson, you know, rhetorical flourish. But, um, but the freedom budget was never fully realized, but so much of it is very much in place today when we talk about things like a universal basic income, the fight for 15 movement, Occupy Wall Street, and so forth. Um, the right. Bernie, San Bernie Sanders' multiple, ca multiple campaigns, the election of democratic socialists around the country, a lot of, the f of what the freedom budget represented um, for developing what, what people hoped for, which was a multiracial working class movement. Um, that that racism could be overcome through fighting for economic as well as social justice, that the economic barriers that are set up by the capitalist system intentionally split people apart, especially along racial lines. Right. And how those, those false conscious, that sort of the, that false consciousness of division is hampering our ability to truly build that multiracial working class movement for socialism. Right. Yeah. We have a couple comments that are okay. related. Uh, uh, Jeff Thomas Black says, uh, Louisiana, Louisiana used prison slaves for sanitation pickup in 2020 during the COVID crisis. Yeah. And inmates are being used to pick up garbage in New Orleans East while the workers are on strike. Yep. And we're seeing this already. So with the UPS strike, which is likely imminent here in the United States, which will, if, if, if they go on strike will be the largest single industry union strike in the history of the United States. Um, it'll be hundreds of thousands of workers on strike. <laughs> UPS is already hiring scabs for the, for, or, or working on hiring scabs to replace these people temporarily um, because the talks between the Teamsters Union and UPS completely collapsed about a week ago. Um, so yeah, we're seeing the same thing there. And then obviously when we think about the, the, the messed up wording of the 13th amendment, which we've talked about before where, you know, the banishing the ending of slavery in America um, except for his punishment of crime. And that's the way that they get out of it. Um, uh -huh. And that's the way they can use it. But yes, it's, it's, it's a brutal, it's oppressive, it's awful. And it's not um, surprising. Yeah, the uh, I think it was citations needed, or maybe it was the Real News Network mm -hmm. uh, was talking about the UPS uh, mm -hmm. pos potential strike and some of the headlines that that are, are have been or the the media framing right about how it's like uh, economic disaster. It's uh, yeah, they're framing it that way. Yeah, they always got to frame it as though the strikers are in are causing the economic disaster. It's never the uh, the company that refuses to negotiate. Exactly. It's the same thing with what's going on with the writers and actors strike right now, yeah. right? Like, like the the industries that are not are not um, are not accepting the very reasonable reasonable demands of writers and and um, actors. Um, they've lost more money than they ever would have lost if they had just given the actors and writers what they wanted. Yeah. But ultimately. It's about control because if if the, you you know because if we give yeah. them an inch they can take a mile. Jeff Thomas Black says need to cause we need economic. to cause yes we that's absolutely right. that's yeah. the whole point of a strike. <laughs> the whole point is to be disruptive. If yeah. if you if you have a labor action and it's not disruptive, you're it's you, not yeah. it's not it's not <laughs> it's not going to work. It's not exactly. viable. You have to shut it down. Um, you know, so, well, I mean, I think people have talked a lot about it this year with what they call strike summer. I'm all for it. Yeah. There's nothing, more, there's nothing in, more important in my life that I need that, that overrides the solidarity that I have with the UPS workers, with SAG-AFTRA, with um, Amazon workers, with whatever. And yeah. so um, Starbucks workers, what have you. Um, I, I've, I'm very much of the mind of, you know, shut the motherfucker down. Like, I don't care. Um, and, and they're, they're going to use all of the arguments. They're going to talk about like, oh, well, this is going to disrupt working. Like they'll use like, well, working class people's lives will be made harder by this. And the cost of goods will go up and people who are poor will be harmed by this. And it's like, 
Yeah, but but at the same time, first off, you don't even know if that's actually true. Right. And two, um, you could just lower prices instead of fucking price gouge like you're doing. Uh, yeah. And there's, so it's, it's all nonsense. There's a lot wrong with that. It's all, it's all backwards, right? Like It's, it's all backwards. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's very interesting, and libertarians use this a lot. They use the language of talking about people in poverty and talking about the plight of poverty to defend policies that would keep people in poverty. Yeah, you talk. I'll just say, "Oh no, the imaginary line of Wall Street will get big mad." Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Because yeah. because because we do live in an age of shareholder capitalism, right? Where the only thing that matters yeah. is what's good for the shareholders. And we're going to talk about that later this week when we talk about um, choke point capitalism. Yeah. Um, but but um, you know, and yeah, that book is very, very good, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to talking about it for sure. Um, so so yeah, so. The last thing I'll sort of talk about, and then this can open it up for a little discussion before we finish, is talking about um, the influence of Michael Harrington. Um, so Michael Harrington is kind of the last big person we'll talk about other than A. Philip Randolph. Michael Harrington was one of the sort of the fathers of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, and he was very influential in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, largely as a result of his book, The Other America, um, which was a book about poverty. Um, and, and kind of a, a very visceral portrait of the horrific poverty in the United States. Um, so the war on poverty of the Great Society of Lyndon Johnson in many ways were were a response to what Harrington was bringing to the table. Um, and he would involve be would be involved in the formation of the Democratic Socialists of America in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, he would die rather young. I think he dies in the late 80s, early 90s, and he dies of cancer. But his influence on democratic socialist left politics is very big in the sense that he very much believed in the idea of the one of the only ways we might be able to effectively do what we want to do and build the world we want to build is by sort of taking over the Democratic Party, that, that we move mm -hmm. the Democratic Party away from being the party of Clintonism and neoliberalism and moving it back to being the party of working people and the New Deal and the Great Society. Now, I'm not necessarily opposed to any of that because I think there's a lot of good about the New Deal and the Great Society, right. flaws and all. Um, a, a great social democratic vision. The problem is, is that I don't, I think that that, I think believing in that approach in 1989 made some sense. Right. I don't know if it mean, if it makes any sense today. And, and part of it is it's because I feel like if you look at what happens to people who are nominally democratic socialists or people who belong to the DSA and they're elected to positions of power, they often become essentially neutralized or yeah. they become uh, um, impotent in the face of growing challenges. I think the fact that AOC went ahead and just endorsed Biden um, is, I think, a clear <laughs> indication of that. Right. Um, the fact that Bernie pretty much ruled out a third run and endorsed Biden is another example of this. Yeah. That ultimately what happens is, is that you don't change the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party changes you. Yeah. And, but at the same time, do we really all just want to be a part of like fringe left groups that are sort of <laughs> ideologically pure? But, but never then, do anything. But then, it, but don't no actually ever do anything other than yeah. split off into different tendencies because. You know, somebody read a, a line of the Grundry so wrong and we have to disagree. <laughs> so I think like, I think both of those approaches have their limitations. Um, I think the best argument for Harrington's idea is that if you push the Democratic Party left, genuinely push it left, and it becomes a genuinely sort of social democratic party, as we've talked about before in the show, it moves the Overton window in America to a more reasonable, reasonable, um, uh, sort of um, spectrum. It, it becomes right. a more reasonable spectrum where where the uh, political ideas like worker ownership and um, decommodification, all of those become more and more relevant and become possible. They become possible in a way that they wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Um, so that's, I think, maybe the best argument for sort of the Harrington approach. Having said that, I always think that yeah, some random geek. 
<laughs> yes. Justin, you know that leftists will always disagree with each other. This is true, right? And that's part of like, like honestly, like that's a. I don't think that's a bad thing. Like, I think that's genuinely, in some respects, a good thing. Um, but at the same time, also got another. Sorry, yeah. I, sorry to interrupt. No worries. <laughs> Utah Outcast also says, I'm just so tired of the blatant fascism. The Overton window is so far right. We've hit the spot where the pendulum is never supposed to hit. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. And not only that, but you look at the crisis of capitalism has brought us this crisis, right? That, that yeah. we're, seeing, we're seeing trends that were already happening being accelerated by the pandemic and being accelerated by the war in Ukraine of tendencies that were there and they're becoming even more prominent, right? Yeah. The fact that essentially a fascist leader was elected the head of Italy is very, very concerning. The fact that you're seeing states in the United States, states in the US like Tennessee, flagrantly sort of trying to make political opposition illegal. They're doing the same thing in Florida. Yeah. Um, you're seeing, I don't think that it's a coincidence that as we're seeing the the massive amounts of inequality and economic devastation that has wrought against most of the American working class that we're seeing a political elite that have become absolutely feral and barbarous, you know, like the governor of Texas advising, um, you know, uh, INS agents to basically throw people in the water, including children right. who are trying to cross the border. Right. It's yeah. truly barbarous behavior. Yeah. And, the problem is, is that the Democratic Party, as it currently is, is not up to the task of addressing this seriously. They're just not. Yeah. And I think if if you if you're constantly capitulating and trying to do a form of sort of necro politics, it's a, it's a dead politics. Like every time I see Joe Biden, I see essentially a, like a corpse of neoliberalism. Um, he's a great, he's a great physical manifestation of the sort of the absolute death and, and, and the sort of decay of the neoliberal order, right? Yeah. And as it, and as it decays, we're seeing all of these problems. And yeah. that's because there is not a viable left in America, not in a way that would be influential. And I think that's really frustrating. I think that's part of the reason why I think maybe we do have to put some of our differences aside and figure out the, the idea of a popular front, the idea of really right. working together with other people and trying to build a big coalition to stop fascism. Because we're going to have to do that. Because yeah. that's the only way it ever worked in the first place. We didn't stop fascism by having a, you know, having a polite and reasonable conversation with them. You know, it, it took the death of millions. And, and Unite all the unions, them, you know, general strike. Yep, you unite all the unions. <laughs> And you and you create a, a sort of red black alliance, which I'm yeah. very much in favor of, right? And we'll talk about that when we talk about revolutionary affinities, um, yeah. because I am I as I get older, I get less sectarian, and I'm very much in the mindset of I will follow what works, uh, and, and I want I want to see a working class politics that actually helps people, and if yeah. that's in the form of a sort of social democratic welfare state, okay. If that's in the form of a you know, and that's in the form of the dictatorship of the proletariat, maybe, although we can debate about whether or not that's a good idea. Right. Um, or if it comes in the form of something like, you know, um, uh, like the Rahava revolution, right? Where we're right. talking about radical decentralization and working class power, you know, however it works, I'm always going to be on the side of how can we get the working class more power? How does that work? Yeah. And I think that Nichols's approach, which is like, well, our best shot in America is probably the Democratic Party. I kind of think that's a dead end. Yeah. Um, and I think that the way to, to change that, the way to change that from being a dead end is by building left institutions that are strong enough and powerful enough to have meaningful influence on the Democratic Party, like they yeah. did in the 1930s, to actually actively um, pursue change. <laughs> yeah, some random geek. We can have the sectarian war of words after the end of fascism and capitalism. Exactly, and, and I've very <laughs> been. I'm very much of the mind that like maybe the future we live in has different societies that have different tendencies, and that that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and that we can, you know, I've talked about this before. I think a much more reasonable Overton window would be like, 
you know, like on the far left, uh, the far right end of it is people like Bernie Sanders or AOC. But that's right. that's as far right as it goes. Yeah, right. right. And as far left is sort of the you know sub subcommandante Marcos and the Rahava Revolution and and you know and 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 the sort of radical sort of libertarian Marxism, I, I, that, you know, or, or libertarian socialism like that. Like yeah. I, I find that to be very compelling. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think however we get there is great, but, but in short, um, I, I, I think this is a good book. I think it's a great introduction for anybody who wants to really learn about socialism in America and learn sort of the history of radical ideas in America. I think it pairs really well. If you've ever read Howard Zinn's a people's history of the United States. Okay. Um, and cause I think that's another book that like, very much like this book is very much sort of a spiritual sequel to in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that American history is not all terrible. I know that it's very easy to think that it is, um, but, but there's it's pockets not, of good. There's, there's many pockets of good. Um, and I think that um, there are things about this, that there are things about the book that reminded me of what, when I was younger, the, the patriotism I did have. Um, and the patriotism to a certain extent I still have um, about America because my my belief in America is built upon what we can become. Mm. I think America can become a, a good country. Um, maybe I'm naive on that level. I probably am. But I do genuinely believe that we can build a society. And whether it's called the U.S. or not, I don't really care. Right, yeah. I don't really yeah. give a shit about that. Like if we, you know, if we become something completely different, but we maintain those ideas of liberty and equality and justice and like those principles, which are very good principles, principles which should unite anybody, should unite anybody on the political left, yeah. um, uh, that we that would become something else, you know. Um, and I think when you read some of the history of this book, it does give you a sense of which America is not a complete wasteland of doom. It, there's there's something to be said here. Um, and well, yeah. that's good. So sounds like uh, uh, there might be some hope in your heart there. <laughs> that's good. No, absolutely. So here's here's the thing. Here's what, how you say this, right? So we've talked about Terry Eagleton on the show. Yep. Um, he has a book called Hope Without Optimism. Okay. I think that's a very healthy way of looking at this. I think optimism, especially blind optimism, right. or belief in that sort of capital P progress we talked about. Yeah. Um, I think that's I think that's also a dead end. I think it will lead you to nihilism. I think it will lead you to um, sort of defeatism. Right. But I think hope, especially radical hope, um, is something that should unite us all. And in hope for the possibility of things being different. Because that's that's what that's what that's what makes us the left right. is the possibility of things being better, yeah. not the possibility of things staying the same or getting worse, but the possibility of things getting better. And I think that that sense of hope, not necessarily pair with optimism, is a good thing. And I think right. that's the way we should. That's a healthy attitude towards the world. Yeah, I like that. Well, I guess uh, we're probably done for today so We're probably done this is yeah this is the main episode yeah so um, what are we covering next time i guess so in, so in two, in two days, days <laughs> we'll be covering um choke point capitalism by rebecca giblin and um cory doctorow, doctorow. Yeah. and i love this book uh, i can't wait to talk about it because i think I'm it's a really big fan of cory doctorow so me too <laughs> me too and he's got a new book coming out in the fall um which is, is very similar i forget what that one's blue? called yeah, some, his, yeah, something like that. But it's very similar to Ben Tarnoff's book that we covered earlier this year, ah. but demo decommodifying and democratizing the internet. But I think I think Cory Doctorow is really really cool. Um, yeah, I've read a lot. I've read all exclusively his nonfiction. I've never actually read his fiction. His fiction is what like uh, is why I like him because oh, okay, it's amazing. Like it, I can't he's wait. A very good writer. So. I picked up uh, Radicalized recently. Yeah. We um, just read that for our local uh, book club. Oh, that's it's, great. Uh, it's fucking amazing. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> um, I love the book. And I really like – I talked before about how like sometimes I don't like qualifiers with capitalism. But right. I think this is one that theoretically makes sense within the context of the book. It's like right. explaining what that means rather than saying something like uber capitalism. Like, no, just call it capitalism. But when you're talking <laughs> about capitalism, it's like, well, this is how this – this is how this – 
works within the capitalist system. Right. And we and they do a really good job of explaining that. It's fascinating stuff. Um, and I think very relevant for what's going on right now with the actors and writer strikes too. Because we're going to be talking about the ways in which capitalism kills art. Nice. Kills art. Yeah. All right. So all that's left is where can people find you? So you can find me as always. You can find me at justinclark.org. Yeah. Right down there. You can find me on Instagram and Threads. Threads is the new social media. <laughs> app. All the yeah. hip and with it kids are on. That's right. Um, I'm there at Threads and Instagram at Justin Clark PH, um, where I post book reviews of other books that we don't cover on the show and my writing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's and I'm a regular contributor to the Truth Seeker magazine. So you can always check out my articles in the Truth Seeker, um, which are also available on my blog. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's where people can find me. And as I always like to say, become a patron. Corey works really <laughs> hard guys. You know, he makes this so easy for me. I love this. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, and he does a lot of work for the show. And so please consider becoming a patron. Go check out to, the last episode. I, I'm quite yeah. proud of that one. <laughs> the last episode is really, really good. He did a really good job of editing it. We have really we have a lot of fun in the post game. We do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, yeah. So definitely become a patron um, today. Awesome! Thank you everybody for watching and participating in the chat. And uh, yes, we'll thank you. Ya. We'll be back on Thursday. <laughs> all right. See you then. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. A big thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damian Marie Athope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like or you on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts would be great. If you want to find out more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for watching or listening. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda.